I'd like to also extend my warm welcome to all of you to, for joining us for another year, our 10th, inshallah, annual winter conference. A decade has passed since we began with these uh, winter programs where one of the main objectives is to connect ourselves and our communities <laughs> with people of knowledge, people who have spent the years and the decades of time and effort and dedication that it takes to study at the feet of some of the greatest scholars of our time. And each and every single year, despite the cold weather that we experience at this time of the year, and despite the distances that our guests have to travel, despite the time and the burden that, is, that it is upon their schedules, they make that time and effort to arrive and to travel to us so that we can benefit from them and benefit from their knowledge. And one thing that it is something which uh, I want to share with you and something which we should take as a positive note because it is a positive indication of our community here in the UK at Green Lane Masjid in Birmingham and I know that many of you have come from beyond this city so therefore of the UK in general and perhaps even Europe if there are people here that have traveled that far afield. One of those indications in a time in which we often hear bad news and it's all gloom and doom and it's all pessimism is that our guests and our mashaykh love to travel to us and come to us because of the eagerness and the dedication that they see of the brothers and sisters here. Most of us sitting here are not necessarily students of knowledge, we're not imams of masjids, we're not people who give the Friday khutbah, but we are people who inshallah ta'ala want to learn about our religion and want to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by performing one of the greatest acts of ibadah and worship that a person can perform after the obligatory deeds. And that is to seek knowledge of our religion. And that's something which is heartening. It is heartening and heartwarming for our guests as they travel here, our shuyukh. It is heartening for us as a community when we see that despite the, the time being a time of holiday, a time where people are off and people have other things that they could be doing, despite the cold, bitter cold weather, despite all of these other external factors, we still make that time and dedication to come to spend time in the masjid and learning. And when we put this program together, we know that it's not an easy program. It's not a, it's not a chilled out, comfortable program. The fact that you're sitting here, as inshallah ta'ala you'll be doing over the next few days, from 8 o'clock in the morning onwards until well after Isha, 12 hours plus, where you're sitting on the floor and you're sitting on the ground and you don't have tables and you don't have chairs, that's something which requires a level of dedication and a level of commitment. But that is what seeking knowledge was. I mean, we read the stories of the scholars of the past and of the present, who when they go and they study with their teachers, they dedicate not only the time and not only the years in terms of study, but the difficulty of that study and the hardships that you have to entail within that life of being a student of knowledge. And so each and every single one of us here, inshallah, is a student of knowledge because we've come out to seek that knowledge of this religion. We have for you, inshallah ta'ala, this year, four shuyukh that inshallah are either have arrived, are arriving, will soon arrive, depending on their flight schedules. And those shuyukh have come here, they've taken at that time to come and to spend these next few days with us. This year, our program, as you've seen from the schedule, is slightly different to previous years. What we normally do previously is we often do a morning intensive session until Salatul Dhuhr, and that's where the, the sheikh or the teacher or the, the scholar will go through a classical text and he will explain it for us. And then usually from Dhuhr onwards until the end of the day, we have general lectures on a certain theme. We choose a topic, the Quran or the Prophet Sallam or the companions or the scholars, and those are what the general lectures are about. This year we have changed that schedule and the idea. This year the whole of the conference from the beginning to the end is explanations of, of classical texts or of of mutun, of, of text study, of study texts. And that's because we wanted to take it now to the next level 10 years on where inshallah ta'ala we're not just having you know just general lectures which are beneficial and have their place but because the time that these scholars come to the UK is very limited and that opportunity only often occurs once or twice a year, we want to take maximum benefit of that time and have them actually going through classical texts. And so the texts that they choose, it is something which they will be, uh, will, will be an ongoing study of those texts throughout the next few days, inshallah ta'ala. So our first guest that we have today in this evening opening session is uh, someone who is very familiar to us, someone who, may Allah Azza wa Jal preserve him and reward him, is 
He came on the first year that we began this conference. And even though there's been a couple of years where he wasn't able to come, he has been more or less one of our consistent guests and speakers at this annual winter conference. And that is our Sheikh Abdulaziz al-Sadhan, Hafizahullah Ta'ala. He is someone who I don't think needs an introduction, but just by way of reminder, someone who has had the opportunity and the blessing to study with some of the greatest names of our time. Some of them are well known to us, the likes of Sheikh Ibn Baz and Sheikh Nathaymeen, Rahimahumullah, and others, names that we've heard of so many times, names that we're familiar with, people who we've heard so many stories about. Our Sheikh here is someone who spent years and years with them, studying with them, getting to know them personally, having one-on-one -on -one time with them, and he developed a close relationship with them. But he has many other shuyukha, many other teachers, and I was just discussing with the Sheikh that it would be nice to know about some of those other teachers who aren't so well known, names that perhaps unless you're a student of knowledge you probably haven't heard of or come across, but they are just as senior in terms of their knowledge and just as well grounded in terms of the knowledge that they bring to the table as well. And you know, may Allah, uh, inshallah, I hope that we will have an opportunity to hear from him the names and the stories of some of those scholars as well. But inshallah, for today's uh, lecture, he's going to do like an opening kind of lecture, which we've left the topic to him. It's very general, just to kind of uh, start off this program, inshallah ta'ala. And then throughout the next few days, his topic that he's going to be concentrating on is uh, principles or foundations of knowledge, where he's going to choose, now having been with us for more or less a decade, the things that he thinks that we will benefit from in a wide variety of sciences and different uh, fields of knowledge that he will inshallah ta'ala explain to us over the next few days. So inshallah with that I'm going to uh, open up the floor to him and inshallah he can begin with his lecture. Assalamu <coughs> alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد فأشكر الله تعالى الذي يسر ما كان عسيرا وقرب ما كان بعيدا وهيأ لنا جميعا من أمورنا رشدا ثم أشكر الإخوة القائمين على هذا المركز في نشاطهم وحرصهم على إقامة هذه الدورات العلمية والأيام العلمية وهذا العمل من أعظم القربات وأنفع الدرجات لأنه لأن نفعه ليس قاصرا على زيد أو على واحد أو على اثنين بل إن نفعه أو تتسع دائرة نفعه لانتشار العلم من السامعين إلى من يبلغونه من أهليهم وجيرانهم ومن بلغ the Sheikh began after praising Allah Azza wa and sending salutations upon our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He began by thanking Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, the one who has made that which may have seemed difficult, easy, and that which seemed afar, brought close and near to us. He thanked Allah Azza wa for the blessing of being able to come and begin with this program. And then the brothers at this masjid and the sisters who are from the organizers of these annual conferences, uh, for their eagerness and for their commitment to this program where they bring people together and they bring them together to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through seeking knowledge. And he said that the benefit of these programs and these conferences isn't just limited to one or two or three individuals, but it's something which benefits many. And those people who are here will go back and they will teach their families and their neighbors. <laughs> يتحدثون عن نعمة الأكل والشرب والمال واللباس والمسكن والأمن وهذه لا شك أنها من النعم لكن من أعظم نعم الله نعمة العلم التي يعرف الإنسان بها كيف يعبد ربه وكيف يجتنب نهي ربه كيف يوحد الله توحيدا سليما كيف يصلي صلاة صحيحة موافقة لهدي النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ولهذا قال الشيخ ابن سعدي رحمه الله تعالى لولا العلم لكان الناس كالبهائم فالإنسان مفضل بالعلم ولهذا ينبغي أن ندرك أن نستشعر هذه النعمة فهذه المجالس العلمية من أعظم المجالس 
يتعلم فيها الإنسان ويزداد فيها تنورا فيعرف كما تقدم كيف يعبد ربه وكيف يجتنب نهيه Sheikh said that the blessings of Allah Azza wa Jal are many and when people usually discuss Allah's blessings they speak about the blessing of food or drink or of wealth or of clothing or of accommodation and where they live or of security and note that all of these are from the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but from the greatest of blessings that Allah Azza wa Jal has bestowed upon us is the blessing of knowledge so that we may learn how to worship our Lord we may learn how to stay away from what Allah has prohibited we learn how to believe in Allah and have tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a pure and sincere way. We learn, for example, how to pray correctly in accordance to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's why Shaykh ibn al-Sa'di, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, were it not for knowledge, then people would be like the animals. They would be like animals. The way that we are better than them, the way that we have superiority over animals is through knowledge, the fact that we learn. And so from the greatest of gatherings and the most beneficial of them is the one in which you increase in knowledge so that you learn how to worship your Lord and stay away from that which he has prohibited. And والمرئية والمسموعة سهولة العلم فالإنسان يرى ويسمع ويقرأ ما كان لا يحصل إلا بالتعب الشديد والسفر الطويل قد كان السلف عليهم رحمة الله يسافرون الأشهر الطويلة وبعضهم يتغيب السنوات في سبيل طلب العلم وتحصيله الشيخ said that also from the great blessings of Allah عز وجل upon us especially in this country and in uh, countries similar to this is the fact that it is easy for us to acquire knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us now the technology and the different methods of of, of or mediums of, of technology that allow us to seek knowledge so we can read and we can listen and we can watch and we can learn in this way the sheikh said that this is something which we shouldn't take for granted because this knowledge previously, in previous generations, in previous centuries, it was something which would only be acquired through a great deal of effort. The scholars of the past, the Salaf, rahimahumullah ta'ala, some of them would be absent for months, if not years, because they would have to travel to seek that same knowledge. لكن أعظم الهدايا هدية العلم قال كعب بن عجرة رضي الله تعالى عنه لأحد أصحابه ألا هدي لك هدية ثم علمه كيفية الصلاة والسلام على النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فهدية العلم أعظم من هدية المال هدية المال تنتهي بانتهاء وقتها أما هدية العلم تبقى وتزداد انتشارا بحسب ما يتهاداها الآخرون the Sheikh said that from what would bring joy and happiness to the companions and to their students from amongst the tabi'een and those who followed them is when they would be gifted knowledge, gifting knowledge to one another. The Sheikh said because a gift is something which, which is beloved to us. Naturally, we love people who gift things to us and we love receiving gifts. But the greatest of gifts that you can receive is the, is the gift of, of knowledge. It is greater than the gift of wealth. Wealth or money that you're given is only so good as it lasts. After it, after it finishes, that, that gift also finishes. But the gift of knowledge is something which lasts well beyond its limited or the, or the limited use of money. Like for example, the companion Kaab ibn al-Ujra radiallahu an, he said to one of his uh, companions or one of his students, shall I not give you a gift? And then he taught him how to send salat and salam upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That was his gift towards him because it is something which continues and it lasts and it benefits for a much longer time. وأيضاً ثمرة العلم ليست مقصورة على سماعه فحسب كما تقدم الإنسان إذا سمع العلم فهناك العمل به وهناك الدعوة له وهو إهداؤه وتعليمه الآخرين وهناك الاستمرار لا تنقطع إطلاقاً 
المال زكاته ربع العشر والزرع زكاته واتوا حقه يوم حصاده والعلم زكاته ان تعمل به وان تبلغه وان تستمر في تبليغه تبدا باهل بيتك واصحابك وجيرانك ومن عرفت وبلغ من علمته ان يعلم من وراءه Sheikh said that from the fruits of knowledge or the benefits of knowledge is that it's not just that you hear it alone. It's not just the acquiring of knowledge that is from that makes knowledge beneficial, but rather it is that you will act upon it, implement that knowledge, that you will call others towards it, and that's what we mentioned as gifting knowledge when you teach others. And it is that it is something which is continuous, something which continues, and isn't something which is just time limited. For example, the Sheikh said that when we give zakah of money, we give 2.5%. 2.5% is the zakah of money. If, for example, you have uh, agriculture, the zakah is due on the day that it's harvest, it's harvested. The zakah of knowledge is that you teach others. That is the zakah that you give for knowledge, that you spread that knowledge towards others and you teach them so that they may benefit and you tell them to continue to pass that knowledge on to others that you haven't reached. <laughs> السلف على نشر العلم كان الفاروق عمر رضي الله تعالى عنه إذا سافر تجار أرسل معهم فقيها يعلمهم أحكام البيع حتى لا يقعوا في الحرام ولا يقعوا في الشبهات وأيضا كان ذكر بعض المؤرخين أن بعض المعلمين أو بعض طلاب العلم كان يقف عند مكان الوضوء ويراقب وضوء الناس فمن أخطأ دله على الصواب حتى سماه بعضهم يعني هذا الرجل وأمثاله بشيخ الوضوء أو بشيوخ الوضوء والمطاهر يعلمون الناس الوضوء الصحيح. The Sheikh said that it's uh, that it's well known amongst the Salaf that they were people who would teach that knowledge and spread that knowledge. It's reported, for example, that Umar رضي الله عنه when he was the خليفة when a group of uh, traders would travel, when they would go on a long journey to trade, he would send with them a scholar so that that scholar would travel with them and he would teach them at the same time the rulings of buying and selling of trade and commerce. And that's so that they wouldn't fall into something which was doubtful or fall into something which was prohibited. The Sheikh said that other historians, other scholars mention that there was, uh, that some of the students of knowledge, what they would do is they would stand at the place where people come to make wudu, the wudu area. They would stand there and they would watch people as they make wudu and if someone made a mistake, they would correct them and they would teach them how to make wudu correctly. And because they became so well known, so famous for that, they became known as the Sheikh of Wudu. Because that's what they would do in terms of spreading that knowledge that they had. وكان يفتو الناس ويعلم الناس وبعضهم استقر في المدينة وبعضهم في العراق وبعضهم في الشام وأصبحوا مدارس بل جامعات يعلمون الناس العلم. The historian Ibn Sa'd in his book at Tabaqat he mentions how the companions dispersed across the Muslim empire across the Muslim lands so that they would go to different lands and they would reside there and they would live there so that they could teach people. He mentions the companions, for example, who settled in Mecca, other companions who remained in Medina, others who went all the way to Iraq or to Asham. And each one of them became a school or rather a university of learning and teaching that the people of that locality, the people of that community would benefit from. هذا مما يزيد العبد أجرا وثوابا عند الله ومما يزيد العلم انتشارا فإهداؤك لأخيك فادية علمية تنبهه عن خطأ يقع فيه في عقيدة في عبادات في معاملات في أخلاق هديتك له بتنبيه علميا لخطأه أعظم وأفضل من إعطائك له هدية مطعومة أو مشروبة the Sheikh says, so therefore, whenever we hear something which is beneficial, any point of benefit, we should be eager to preserve it, to thank Allah Azza wa Jal and praise Him that we learn something new. 
and we should be eager to implement it and act upon it and we should be eager to teach it and to spread it amongst the others because this is how we increase when we spread that knowledge towards others we increase in the reward and this is the gifting of knowledge so when you see a brother of yours who makes a mistake in their belief in their worship in their for example their character you teach them and you correct them and you advise them that is a much greater gift and far more beneficial than if you were to give them something to eat or to drink or to give them some money wa fi hadha al yawm athnayn al muwafaq lil rabi' wal 20 min al shahr al rabi' lil 'am al 40 wal 40 ba'da al 100 al rabi'ah wal 1000 al hijrah al nabawiyah al muwafaq lil 23 من الشهر الثاني عشر للعام التاسع عشر بعد الألفين ميلادي أبدأ في محاضرتي في هذا المسجد وستكون محاضراتي عن مواضيع متنوعة أبدأها في هذا المجلس بمسائل في الصلاة وسأسأل بعدما أفرغ على ما ذكرت وهناك بعض الجوائز العينية و تشجيعا لمن أجاب والقصد من ذلك من السؤال هو أن يترسخ العلم في الذهن ويزداد السامع تنبها وتيقظا. الشيخ said so after that brief introduction we now move on to uh, the topic of today's lecture and the sheikh said that what he's going to do throughout this conference inshallah over the next few days is speak about different topics different issues or principles of knowledge in different sciences and fields that inshallah will be beneficial to us. He said that tonight he will begin by speaking about some issues concerning the prayer, the salah. And he said that I will mention those points of benefit and then after that I will ask you concerning them, I will test you and if you answer correctly there will be uh, some prizes that are allocated for that. And he said the point of those questions, that question and answering that kind of interaction is so that we uh, we revise that knowledge and so that inshallah ta'ala it is something which uh, which is is uh, more embedded within us. المسألة الأولى أو الهدية العلمية الأولى يظن كثير من الناس أن تلبيس الشيطان على المصلي في صلاته لا يكون إلا بإشغاله بالخواطر وهذا الفهم قاصر وخاطئ. The Sheikh said that the first gift of knowledge that he wants to gift to us is that many of us think that when shaitan comes to us in our prayer to distract us, what that means is that he distracts us in our minds, he distracts us in our thinking, in our concentration. The shaykh said that that is a very limited understanding and a, an incorrect understanding of all that shaitan can do to divert us from the prayer. فالشيطان يأتي المصلي في شأن صلاته في مواضع ثلاثة قبل الصلاة وفي أثناء الصلاة وبعد الصلاة. الشيخ said that actually shaitan can come to us at three different times to distract us from the prayer. He can come before the prayer, do things before the prayer. He can do things throughout and during the prayer, and he can do things after we finish from the prayer. أكرر سأذكرها على شكل فقرات ثم أسأل فيها من باب ترسيخ العلم. Sheikh said, so pay attention, he's going to mention these points and then he's going to ask you questions about them. أما قبل الصلاة الموضع الأول تأخيره وإكساله عن القيام إلى الصلاة. The Sheikh said that when it comes to the first category which is before the prayer then what that means is that Shaitan comes and he makes us lazy about establishing the prayer and he delays us from praying. وهذا فيه محذور شرعي أنه إذا كان من طبع الإنسان الكسل فهذه من صفات النفاق وإذا قاموا إلى الصلاة قاموا كسالا. And the Sheikh said, and this is problematic because if this becomes a habit and becomes something which is consistent that a person constantly is lazy when it comes to the prayer, they're delaying the prayer, then that is from the signs of hypocrisy as Allah Azza wa mentions concerning the hypocrites in the Quran when they stand for the prayer, they stand in a lazy manner. وجاء وجاء عن الصحابة رضي الله تعالى أنهم كانوا يحبون أن يقوم الرجل نشطا طلق الوجه طيب النفس إلى الصلاة. 
And it's mentioned amongst the companions that if when they would stand for the prayer or there was someone amongst them who would stand for the prayer, they would like that they stand in an energetic way with a happy face, eager to go and pray. And this is only achieved by concentration and by leaving off laziness. في عادة الوضوء والتنطع في ذلك. The Sheikh said that the second way in which Shaytan comes to us in that first category before the prayer, the second way that he comes to distract us before the prayer is that he comes and whispers to us concerning our wudu and our purification and whether our wudu was correct and whether it's complete or incomplete and so on. والوسواس كما قال أهل العلم شيخ الإسلام فيما أظن غيره نقص في العقل ونقص في الدين. نقص في العقل لأن العقلاء يربؤون بأنفسهم ويستقبحون هذا العمل ونقص في الدين لأن ذلك من ضعف الإيمان لتلبيس الشيطان عليه And as some of the scholars like Ibn Taymiyyah and others said رحمه الله that being susceptible to those types of whisperings of shaytan and those types of doubts from shaytan it shows a deficiency in intellect and a deficiency in iman a deficiency in intellect because someone who is smart knows that these are just whisperings of shaitan and just shaitan is just trying to distract us. And there's a deficiency of iman because it shows the weakness of iman that shaitan can come and attack us in this way. فلا تأتوه وأنتم تسعون وامشوا إليها بسكينة فما أدركتم فصلوا وما فاتكم فاتموا. The Sheikh said that the third way that Shaitan distracts us before the prayer is that if one of us is late for the prayer, we're going to the masjid, but we're late, then we hurry and we rush to get to the masjid and to get to the salah and, and get into the role. The Sheikh said that this is incorrect because the Prophet told us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, don't come to the prayer and you are rushing, but rather come and you are walking with tranquility in a peaceful way and that which you catch of the prayer then pray it and that which you have missed then complete it. وقال لمن دخل مسرعا في عندما كان عليه السلام راكعا دخل أحد الصحابة مسرعا فقال له عليه السلام زادك الله حرصا ولا تعد. And that companion who entered and he rushed into the prayer because the Prophet ﷺ was in ruku' and he wanted to catch the raka' he rushed into the prayer. The Prophet ﷺ said to him after the prayer, May Allah increase you in your eagerness, but don't do that again. إذن هذه مواطن ثلاثة قبل الصلاة. الأول الكسل والتأخر في القيام إلى الصلاة. والثاني الوسواس في الطهارة. والثالث الإسراع في المشي إلى المسجد. The Shaykh said that these are the three ways that shaitan can distract someone before the salah. Number one, by making them lazy and delay the prayer. Number two, by whispering to them with regards to their wudu and their tahara, their purification. Number three, that if someone is late, they, he makes them hasten to the prayer and rush to the prayer. عدم موافقة الإمام تارة يسابق وتارة يخالف وتارة يوافق. The Sheikh said that as for during the prayer, the way that Shaitan distracts us during the prayer, he said the first way that that's done is if we're praying in congregation, that Shaitan comes to someone who's in the congregation and he makes them differ from the Imam. So sometimes they're late from the Imam, they delay following the Imam, they're late in following the Imam, or sometimes they precede the Imam, they're quicker than the Imam. And other times they may follow the Imam correctly. The Sheikh the Sheikh said that the second way that shaitan comes and distracts us is by make us fidgeting, excessive fidgeting in the salah. 
to the extent that if you were to see some of those people and they're praying, but because of the amount of movements that they have or the amount of fidgeting that they're doing, you think to yourself, maybe they're not praying. Maybe they haven't entered into the salah. Maybe they're not in salah. And that's why some of the scholars, for example, of the Shafi'i Madhab, they were of the opinion that if you do three things, three movements that are outside of the scope of the prayer, they're not part of the prayer, then your prayer becomes invalid. The Shaykh said that even though that's a harsh statement, but the meaning of that in terms of it, it reduces your reward and it lessens your reward, he said that is a correct understanding. كان إماما أو مفردا ينقر الصلاة نقرا وهذا منهي عنه أن ينقر الصلاة أن ينقر المصلي الصلاة كنقر الغراب. The Sheikh said that the third way that Shaytan comes to us in our prayer and distracts us is that he makes us hasten our prayer. Whether you're praying individually or maybe you're the Imam, you're leading others to hasten the prayer and to be quick in the prayer because the Prophet ﷺ prohibited us from pecking in the ground or, or praying like the, the crow pecks in the ground, meaning quickly that you're rushing the prayer. أيضا من تلبيس إبليس على المصلي كثرة الشك في عدد الركعات كثرة الشك والشك على أقسام ثلاثة شيء شك نوع وسواس باستمرار هذا لا قيمة له والشك الثاني أن لا يكون الإنسان عادة يعرض كما يعرض سائر الناس الشك الأول عفوا هذا وسواس عند الإنسان دائم في كل صلاة حتى أن بعض المصلين بلغ به الحال أنه يأتي بالسهو بعد كل في كل صلاة وهذا لا شك من تلبيس إبليس والنوع الثاني أن لا يكون وسواسا أن يكون شكا عارضا لا يأتي باستمرار وهذا الذي له أحكام السهو Sheikh said that the fourth way in which shaitan comes to us and he distracts us in the prayer is that he makes us doubtful. He confuses us and makes us doubtful as to how many rak'ahs we've prayed. Have you prayed two? Have you prayed three? Have you prayed four? He makes us doubt. And the Sheikh said that that doubt is of different types. The first type is whisperings of shaitan. Shaitan comes to a person every single prayer. They're constantly in that doubt. Every prayer, they have that same issue, that same doubt, that same confusion. The Sheikh said that this is the type of whispering that you should ignore because it has no value to the extent that there are some people who will after every single prayer they pray they will prostrate for forgetfulness they will make sajjat of sahu for every prayer that they pray because that's how much shaitan is playing with them the second type of doubt is where you don't have that type of condition but it, on the odd occasion it's something which just happens you have a doubt because of a genuine uh, issue or a genuine concern that you had in your salah and you're doubtful as to the number of rak'ahs that you prayed. وهناك نوع ثالث وهو الشك بعد الفراغ من العبادة ينتهي من الصلاة ثم يذهب ثم يشك هذا الشك أيضا إذا كان عادة له فهذا نوع سواس أما إذا لم يكن عادة له فإن كان الوقت قريبا رجع وأتى بما نقص من صلاته وإن كان بعيدا أعد صلاته كلها إن ترك ركنا the Shaykh said that the third type of doubt that a person may have in the prayer is to have doubt after the prayer. So the prayer finishes and now you have doubt as to something that took place in the prayer. Again, if this is something which happens all the time, then again it's from the whisperings of shaitan and should be ignored. But if it's not from your norm, it's not something which happens often or all the time, then if it is something which you have that kind of doubt, that there's an actual doubt that you have in terms of your prayer. If you just finish the prayer and it's something which you just performed a few minutes ago, a short while ago, then you go back and you complete the part of that prayer that you missed if it's one of the essential components of the salah. But if it's something which a, uh, a good deal of time has elapsed, then you just repeat the prayer in totality. <laughs> أجاد فيها كعادته في تقسيم مسائل السهو وبيان الصواب في كل حالة. الشيخ said that this issue of سجدة السهو and having doubt in prayer is something which the scholars of fiqh mention in great detail in great detail in their books. And the sheikh said that there is a very nice short uh, book that has been written, a short uh, treatise that is written uh, and authored by Sheikh Ibn Thaymi Taala, when he discusses and he Sorry. elaborates on the positions of Sajdat al sahu and that's something which has been translated into the English language as well. The mountain al khamis min tashkik wa talbis iblis ala al-musalli fi salatih 
يشككه في الطهارة هل أكملت وضوءك؟ هل أكلت لحم جزور؟ هل انتهت مدة المسحة خفين؟ هل أحدثت؟ هل وهل؟ ويبدأ الشيطان يشغله في صلاته Also, the fifth way that shaitan comes and distracts someone in their prayer is that he makes them during the prayer have doubts concerning their wudu. So the first one that we mentioned was before the wudu, before the salah, they doubt their wudu as they're making it. This is during the prayer, they now doubt their wudu. Did they make their wudu correctly? Have they passed wind in the salah? Did they wipe over their socks correctly? All of those different doubts that shaitan comes with. The third one is the third one, the third one, the دائما كل ما صلى يكون سارحا مفكرا ولا يعقل من الصلاة حتى يكبر الإمام فيكبر بعده. The sixth thing, which is perhaps one of the most common ways in which shaitan distracts a person in their salah, is by distracting them, making them uh, heedless in their salah, neglectful of the salah, and so their mind is constantly busied with other thoughts that distracts them, that lessens their khushu' in prayer, and to the extent that sometimes a person prays and they uh, they were hardly attentive in that salah and hardly understood anything of that prayer. And فقال صلى الله عليه وسلم ذاك شيطان يقال له خنزب فإذا أحسسته فتعوذ بالله منه ثم انفث عن يسارك ثلاثة قال عثمان ففعلته فأذهب الله ذلك عني ومعنى خنزب كما ذكره بعض أهل اللسان العربي اسم للحم المنتن the الرائحة الفاسدة فالشيطان قبيح في اسمه وفي خلقه وفي خلقه وطريقة التعوذ إذا شعرت بالشرحان فتقول بصوت خافت أعوذ تلتفت يسارا وتقول أعوذ بالله خنزب ثم تنفذ ثلاث مرات the Sheikh said, and the way that we overcome that destruction of shaitan when shaitan comes and he makes us think of other things in our salah is what is mentioned in the hadith in Sahih Muslim on the authority of the companion Uthman ibn Abil As. Radiallahu anh, that he complained to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of how shaitan distracts him in his salah. The Prophet said to him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in reply, that is a shaitan, a devil by the name of Khinzab. So if you feel his presence, so he comes to you, then seek refuge in Allah Azza wa Jal, meaning say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem, and then blow lightly on your left three times. The Shaykh said that some of, and, and Allah Azza wa Jal, the, the companion said that when he did this, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala removed these thoughts from him during his salah. The Shaykh said that some of the scholars of the Arabic language, uh, some of the lexicographers, they said that the meaning of the word Khinzab, this name that the Prophet ﷺ gave to this type of devil, comes from the name of foul meat, meat that has gone off, that has become foul, that has a foul odor. The Sheikh said, so shaitan, even his names are foul, his appearance is foul, and his character is foul. And قال عنه صلى الله عليه وسلم فيما معناه خصلتان أجرهما كثير والعامل بهما قليل وذكر منها يسبح الله دبر كل صلاة ويحمده ويكبره يأتي الشيطان أحدهم فيقول اذكر كذا لما لم يكن يذكر فيقول فترك الأذكار والزهد فيها من تلبيس إبليس على المصلي بعد صلاته. The Sheikh said, as for the third category, which is after the prayer, the way that Shaitan distracts us after the salah, is that he comes and he makes us forget to make the adhkar or to leave the adhkar that you should make after the salah. The Prophet told us, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, there are two things: their reward is great, but those who who apply them, who act according to them, are very few. 
And he mentioned from amongst them those who make the tasbih. They say, subhanallah, they say, alhamdulillah, and they say, Allahu Akbar, after the obligatory prayers. Because shaitan will come, he said, and he will make that person remember something which they wouldn't have remembered otherwise. And so a person after the salah, they remember something that they had to do, some chore, some job, and instead of spending that time remembering Allah, they will stand and they will leave. التلبيس الثاني على المصلي بعد صلاته ترك السنن الرواتب بالبعدية بعض الناس يزهد في تلك السنن ويزهده الشيطان فيها ويقول أديت الفريضة فبرئت ذمتك The Shaykh said that the second way the shaitan distracts us after the salah is by making us leave off praying the sunnah prayers the sunnah to rawatib, the sunnah prayers that we pray after the salahs or some of the salahs. And that's because shaitan comes and he says, okay, you've done your job, you've fulfilled your obligation, you've done the obligatory part, you don't need to worry about this. And so instead of praying those prayers, we leave them and we, we go away. أنها من أسباب النوافل عموما والرواتب خصوصا أنها من أسباب محبة الله تعالى لعبده جاء في الخبر القدسي ما تقرب إلي عبدي بشيء أحب إلي مما افترضته عليه تقربه إلي بالنوافل ولا يزال عبدي يتقرب إلي بالنوافل حتى أحبه الشيخ قال أن there are many benefits of performing these optional prayers or these recommended prayers, these nawafi, whether it's the sunnah prayers after the prayer or optional prayers in general. From the greatest of benefits is that it is one of the means and one of the ways in which we bring Allah's love to us. We, Allah Azza wa loves those people who perform those optional deeds. As the Prophet ﷺ told us in the Hadith Al-Qudsi that Allah Azza wa said that one of my servants doesn't seek nearness and closeness to me with something more beloved to me than the obligatory deeds. And he doesn't continue to perform the optional deeds until I love him. الفائده الثانية للنوافل أنها ترقع أو ترمم نقص الفرائض. جاء في الحديث قال صلى الله عليه وسلم أول ما يحاسب العبد عليه الصلاة فإن كملت وإلا قال الله انظروا هل لعبد من تطوع وكذلك في الصيام والزكاة والحج إلى آخره. Sheikh said that from the benefits of performing those optional prayers. Is that it makes up for the deficiencies that we had in our obligatory prayers. When there's a weakness or a deficiency in the obligatory prayer, it is made up by the optional prayers. The Prophet told us وسلم, in the hadith that the first thing that we will be held to account for is the salah. If it is complete, then it is complete. But if not, then Allah will say, Look, does my servant have, or see, does my servant have optional deeds that will make up for those obligatory prayers that were deficient? And likewise, the same will be for zakah, the same will be for fasting and hajj and so on. الفائدة الثالثة للنوافل أن الله تعالى ذكر أن العباد أقسام ثلاثة أعلى وأوسط وأدنى جاء ذلك في سورة فاطر ثم أورثنا الكتاب الذين اصطفينا من عبادنا الأدنى فمنهم ظالم لنفسه والأوسط ومنهم مقتصد والأعلى ومنهم سابق بالخيرات ذكر بعض المفسرين أن الظالم لنفسه هو الذي فرط في الفرائض وأن المقتصد هو الذي اكتفى بالفرائض دون غيرها وأن السابق بالخيرات من أدى الفرائض وتكثر من النوافل الشيخ صدر الله سبحانه وتعالى تعالى في القرآن believing servants are those who he divides them into three categories the believing servants are divided into three categories those who have the highest level those in the middle level and those at the lower level as Allah mentions in Surah Fatir Allah says and then we inherited or caused those who we have chosen from our servants to inherit the book from amongst them are those who oppress themselves and those who are in the middle path who are balanced and those who have superseded others by the permission of Allah Azza wa Jal. Some of the scholars of Tafsir in their commentary of this verse, they said that those who oppress themselves are those who don't fulfill the obligatory deeds. And those who are balanced, those in the middle way, are those who 
just do the obligatory deeds, but they don't do anything more. They just fulfill their obligations. And those who have superseded others and preceded them are those who not only do the obligatory deeds, but they will do many optional deeds as well. وهي أن كثيرا من الناس بل أكثر الناس يؤدون النوافل أو السنن في في المساجد وقليل من يصليها في بيته مع أن الأفضل والأكمل وفعل الرسول والصحابة رضي الله تعالى عنهم أنهم كانوا يصلون النوافل في بيوتهم. Shaykh said that also from the sunnahs with regards to these optional prayers, these sunnah prayers, is that many people choose to pray them in the masjid rather than praying them at home. Even though the practice of the Prophet and the companions and what is better to do is after praying the obligatory prayer in the masjid to pray those sunnah prayers at home, to go home and to pray them there. But the Prophet said that some of the and I think the most important مالك وأبو حنيفة والشافعي وأحمد أن الأفضل لأهل الحرمين أن يصلون النوافل في بيوتهم. To the extent that some of the scholars and some of the well-known imams, like Imam Malik and Abu Hanifa and those four imams, they said to the extent that even the people who live in the two harams in Mecca and Medina, for them it is still better for them to go home and to pray those prayers rather than praying them in those masajid. وقد يستغرب بعضكم كيف يصلون في بيوتهم ويتركون الحرم الجواب أن النبي عليه الصلاة والسلام هو الذي أمرهم وقال لهم في المدينة يخاطب الصحابة في الحرم أفضل صلاة الرجل في بيته إلا المكتوبة. And some of us may question or think why is it that they would pray at home or these scholars said it's better for you to pray at home in those places مكة المدينة when you have the virtues of praying in those two masjids and the added reward to it. And the answer to that, the Shaykh said, is because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the one who taught us this whilst he was in Medina, whilst he was speaking to his companions from his masjid. And he said to them that the best of prayer that a person can pray is in their house except for the obligatory prayers. لقول النبي عليه الصلاة والسلام أفضل صلاة الرجل في بيته إلا المكتوبة. The Sheikh said that there are six benefits to praying and offering those prayers in the house as opposed to the masjid. The first of them is that we fulfill this sunnah, this hadith that we just mentioned, that the best of prayers is the prayer that you pray in your house except for the obligatory prayers. والثاني حرص محافظة النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم على فعل النواف في بيته حتى قال بعض أهل العلم قلما علم أن النبي عليه السلام صلى النافلة في المسجد. The second benefit is that we're following the practice of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم because he would pray his nafil prayers at home to the extent that some of the scholars said that rarely has it been narrated to us that he would offer those prayers in the masjid. ثالثا أن صلاة النافلة في المنزل حيث لا يراه أحد كما في المسجد أفضل كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام. صلاة المرء نافلة حيث لا يراه الناس تفضل على صلاته حيث يراه الناس بخمس وعشرين درجة. The third benefit is that by praying at home, you pray away from the eyes of people and from people observing you. Because the Prophet told us, صلى الله عليه وسلم, for a person to pray their home where no one sees them is better than praying outside where others see them, in public where others see them. Praying at home is twenty-five times better. الفائدة الرابعة أنه كلما عمر البيت بالطاعات كلما كان الشيطان منه أبعد فإذا جاء في الحديث أن المسلم إذا دخل بيته وقال بسم الله قال الشيطان لا مبيت لكم ولا عشاء فكيف إذا سمى وصلى The fourth benefit is that by praying at home you uh, ward off shaytan and you ward off shaytan and his armies from your home by worshipping Allah Azza wa Jalla at home the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that if a person goes home and they mention Allah's name as they enter their house, they say, Bismillah, then Shaitan says that there's no place for me to sleep here or to eat here. And that's just by mentioning Allah's name. Then imagine that person goes in and they stand and they pray and they recite the Quran and they do other acts of worship. Also, 
لأن الصغار إذا رأوا أباهم أو أخاهم يصلي أمامهم يحاكون صلاته يصفون بجانبه يركعون بركوعه وهذا من أسباب تحبيب الصغار للصلاة الشيخ said that the fifth and final benefit is that there is a, an educational benefit in praying at home because your children, people, the youngsters in your family see you praying at home, they learn from your prayer and they may stand next to you and pray or they try to copy your prayer and imitate you as you're praying and that's something which from a young age brings about love in the heart for the salah and for the prayer. أخيراً أختم المجلس بأيضاً مسألة متعلقة بالصلاة وتقدم ذكرها إجمالاً لكني أعيدها تفصيلاً المسألة الثالثة والأخيرة حالات المأمومين في كل المساجد جميع المصلين منذ أن شرعت الصلاة إلى قيام الساعة ينقسمون أربعة أقسام خلف الأئمة the Sheikh said that the final point that he wants to mention to us this evening also concerning the Salah and it's something which he touched upon very briefly but now he's saying that I want to discuss it in more detail is the way people follow the Imam in congregational prayer. If you're praying behind the Imam, the way that people follow the Imam in congregational prayer. And the Sheikh said that this, there are four categories from the beginning of Islam until the end of this world until Yom Al Qiyamah, people are divided into those four categories because you must fall into one of those four. ولا بد أن تصنف نفسك أو صنف نفسي من أحد الأقسام الأربعة. And we must judge which one of those four categories we fall into. القسم الأول المسابقون من يركعون قبل الإمام ويرفعون قبله. وهذا النوع لا يجوز بل عده بعض أهل العلم من الكبائر لأن في تعريف الكبيرة عند أهل العلم ما ختم بذنب أو وعيد ما ختم بوعيد بوعيد أو تهديد وقد جاء في هذا في مسابقة الإمام وعيد قال عليه الصلاة والسلام أما يخشى الذي يرفع رأسه قبل الإمام أن يحول الله صورته صورة حمار أو أن يقلب الله رأسه رأس حمار. الشيخ said that the first of those four categories of people in terms of praying in congregation and following the Imam are those people who precede the Imam. They're quicker than the Imam. They go into record before the Imam. They come out of record before the Imam. They're always a step ahead of the Imam. And the Sheikh said, without doubt, this is impermissible to the extent that some of the scholars said that it is from the major sins. Because some of the scholars of Islam define the major sin as a sin that has a, an explicit punishment associated with it. The Prophet ﷺ gave us a specific warning or a punishment associated with that sin. And the Prophet told us وسلم, don't those who come out of record before the Imam, don't they fear that Allah will change them into donkeys or that Allah will change their heads into the heads of donkeys? And that's and in another hadith that is also authentic in Bukhari, the Prophet ﷺ said openly to his companions, don't precede me, don't be faster than me, don't precede me in ruku' or coming out of ruku' or uh, in, in prostration or in leaving the prayer and finishing the prayer. وقد ذكر ابن حجر أو غيره أن رجلا كان يسابق الإمام ويقول كيف يقرب الله رأس الإنسان رأس حمار ذكر ابن حجر وغيره أن أنه أنه شاهد رجلا يمشي وقد غطى جهة من وجهه فتعجب منه فسأل أو سئل هذا الرجل لما تغطي وجهك فكشف عن وجهه فإذا شق حمار وقال كنت أسخر من قول النبي عليه الصلاة والسلام أما يخشى الذي يرفع رأسه قبل الإمام أن يقلب الله صورته صورة حمار أو يحول الله رأسه رأس حمار فقلت كيف أن يكون الإنسان حمارا فكنت أسابق الإمام عمدا فبليت بما ترى And the scholar Ibn Hajar رحمه الله or the Sheikh said maybe another scholar he mentioned that there was a man who used to question this hadith and he was like how can Allah change someone's head into the head of a donkey and so he would intentionally on purpose he would come out of record before the Imam he would 
be a step ahead of the Imam because he was making fun and making light of this hadith. The author who mentions this story, he said, I, I was once walking and I saw a man who was walking and he had covered half of his face. Half of his face was covered. So I asked him, why are you covering half of your face? And he uncovered it and it resembled a donkey's face. And he said to me, because I used to make fun of this hadith and I would question openly, how can the Prophet, how does Allah change someone, someone's head into the head of a donkey? So I would intentionally, purposefully uh, precede the Imam in Salah and now Allah has done this to me. إذن الحالة الأولى المسابقون وهذه لا تجوز الحالة الثانية الموافقون يركعون مع الإمام سواء بسواء ويرفعون سواء بسواء كالظل مع الشاخص أو كالإنسان أمام المرأة وأنا أسألكم هل هذا الفعل صواب أو خطأ the, so that's the first category. The first category are those who are faster than the Imam. The second category, the Sheikh said, are those who are in line exactly with the Imam. They make the ruku as the Imam makes the ruku. They come out as he comes out. They make sajda as he makes sajda. Exactly, almost the Sheikh said, like a shadow to the Imam. And the Sheikh said, I want to ask you, is that permissible? Is that allowed? القسم الثالث المتأخرون يركع الإمام هذا قائم ثم يركع بعد الإيام بفترة أو يستمر واقفا حتى يرفع الإمام في السجود يسجد الإمام وهذا ما زال جالسا فإذا قارب الإمام الرفع سجد بعده فهل هذا صواب أو خطأ؟ The third category are those who delay following the Imam The Imam is in ruku and he's been there a while and then they go into ruku or maybe sometimes he's almost ready to come out of ruku and now they decide to go into ruku or the Imam is in sajda and they're still sitting down for the sitting in between the two sajda. They're still sitting there and waiting until the Imam is about to go get out of sajda and then they go into sajda and so on and so forth. The Sheikh said, is that allowed? الحالة الرابعة المتابعون وهم من يركعون بعد الإمام مباشرة ويرفعون بعده مباشرة لا يسابقونه ولا يوافقونه ولا يخالفونه بل the Sheikh said, and the fourth category of people are those who follow the Imam. They wait for the Imam to go into Rukur and they follow him into Rukur. He comes out of Rukur, they follow him out of Rukur. They're not a step ahead of the Imam. They're not exactly timing themselves with the Imam. And they're not someone who delays following the Imam. They follow the Imam as they should, as he should be followed. وهذا هو الصواب لقوله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا كبر الإمام فكبروا الفاء هنا عند أهل اللغة للتعقيب المباشر يعني كبر بعده مباشرة and these or this fourth category is what is correct and how we should be following the imam in congregational prayer because the prophet told us sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when the imam makes the takbir then make the takbir and the fa in the Arabic language that's mentioned in the hadith the then means do it immediately after him don't wait around do it immediately after him أقف عند هذا الحد وأسأل الله التوفيق للجميع وأطرح بعض الأسئلة وأنتظر أو أسمع الإجابة ولمن أجاب بالصواب جائزة شيخ سيد so now we come on to uh, the uh, last part of this lecture which is the question and answer session or him asking you and you answering his questions and the sheikh said for those of you that answer correctly there is a, a prize طبعا دائما في الأسئلة يكون الإنسان متأكدا من السؤال وكل ما كان الجواب كاملا استحق الجائزة. الشيخ said that obviously before you answer the question you must first make sure that you understood the question that's being asked and the more complete the answer you know the more likely you are to get the prize. وإذا كان الجواب ناقصا له نصف الجائزة. And if the answer is only half complete, then you get half a prize. And if you get the answer wrong, then there's a punishment. Do you agree? The punishment is that you can't have dinner tonight. طيب. أسأل يا الأكارم. ذكرت أن الهدايا أقسام. فما هي أفضل هدية ولماذا؟ 
Sheikh said that he mentioned that there are different types of gifts that you can give to a person. What, are, what is the best gift that you can give and why? Masha'Allah. Why? Masha'Allah. هدية مالية وهدية عليكم السلام هذه هدية لجيبك وهذه لبطنك يلا السؤال الثاني ذكرت مثالين على حرص السلف على تعليم العلم وعلى نشر العلم أحدهما لعمر الخطاب رضي الله تعالى عنه طيب هذا مثال أول So the question was, uh, for those of you who didn't listen, he mentioned two examples of the eagerness amongst the scholars in terms of teaching people. MashaAllah. Tafadhar akra. Ta'ala. Salaam. Hadi al hadiyya raaka. Hadi atiha ibrik al sagheer. MashaAllah alayka. Tayyip. السؤال الثالث ذكرت أن هناك مفهوم خاطئ عند كثير من الناس في تلبيس إبليس على المصلين ما المفهوم الخاطئ؟ Sheikh said that we mentioned that there's an incorrect understanding of uh, how some people think that shaitan distracts a person in their prayer what is that incorrect understanding? وما المفهوم الصحيح؟ and what is the correct understanding? الشيطان يشغلك وقت أثناء الصلاة بالأفكار الخاطئة المفهوم الصحيح أنها يشغلك قبل الصلاة وأثناء الصلاة ما شاء الله طيب سؤال من يعطيني يأتي الشيطان المصلي في صلاته كما قال الأخ الكريم في ثلاث في مواضع ثلاثة قبل وبعد وفي أثناء أريد أريد قبل الصلاة the Sheikh said, who can mention now some of the ways that shaitan distracts a person before the salah? Before the salah, yes. He was just in the water, in the water, in the water. And? That's it. You are here in the salah. Yes. ما شاء الله عليك هذه خمسة طيب بقي سؤالان وثلاثة المواضع التي في أثناء الصلاة خمسة وستة أريد منها ثلاثة So now during the prayer the way shaitan distracts someone during the prayer the shaykh wants three three examples You have to speak up Come closer. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Had the mutabah to the imam. MashaAllah. Say that again, sorry. Hey, lahu, yadhkur halat mutabah to the imam. Yadhkur halat. Okay. موافقة الإمام أو يتأخر عن الإمام. That's three. What's the last one? Good, good, good.
libertad. ما شاء الله. وين ذهبت؟ هذا هو. ايش قال؟ اسال هذا. تعال صح. شغلك في الصلاة شيطان ورات. اكسلنت. طيب أكتفي بسؤال أخير وهو أني ذكرت أن للنوافل فوائد كثيرة في البيوت أريد ثلاث فوائد. So we mentioned the benefits of praying at home, the nafal prayers, three benefits. نعم. نعم. ما شاء الله. يكتب في الصفحات يقرأ من الصفحات تفضل <تصفيق> عاك الله شكرا لك يا شيخ قبل الختام يا كارم أؤكد على ما سبق تأكيده وهو أن ما نستفيده من الفوائد ليس فقط أن نكتبها وتبقى عندنا في الأوراق أو نحفظها بل نعمل بها نحمد الله على نعمة العلم ونعمل بها ونعلمها من يحتاج بخاصة من كان يخطئ فإذا رأيت من يخطئ في صلاته فأفده بتعليم الصواب وكذلك أيضا حتى من كان مصيبا وكان يحتاج إلى بعض الفوائد وهي عندك وليست عنده علم ابدأ بوالديك ابدأ بأولادك إخوانك بجيرانك إذا جلست مع زملائك فقل لهم عندي فائدة علمية عندي هدية علمية بهذه ينتشر العلم ويزداد النفع. Sheikh said that it is important to give these beneficial points of knowledge as gifts to one another. So when you have someone that you know is making mistake and issue, you give them that knowledge and you teach them what is correct. And even sometimes people who know they're praying correctly or they're doing things correctly, but maybe they don't always have all of the benefits, so they don't understand all of the benefits of what they're doing. You teach them, and those people then teach their families, their neighbors, their friends, their colleagues, and this is how knowledge is spread amongst people. Shukran lakum, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, inshallah, we're going to come to the conclusion uh, here of this evening. Inshallah, tomorrow morning at eight o'clock, we begin with our first session, uh, which is uh, the early session. And one of the things that I would like to see everyone do is to have their pens and papers out and to make notes so that it's not just something which you hear and you forget, but it's something which you write down, insha'Allah, and remember. Barakallah. <laughs> Wa alaykum.